Good morning, congregation, and welcome once again to the Sunday morning services. Let us come to God, our Heavenly Father, in prayer. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and eternal God, we would ask for thy blessing upon the service this morning, and help us to understand the teaching which the Holy Bible has about thy Son, our Saviour, who is both God and man. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The theme of this morning's sermon is Jesus is God. Jesus is God. And it's really taken from John's Gospel, chapter 1, in which the Apostle says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Some time ago I spoke on the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. I have two stories to relate about this most holy and true Christian teaching. One concerned a group of Mohammedan children, about five boys, who all approached me together, as they do, with their chests puffed out, trying to look like their dads, as they do, at primary years five and six, upon the subject. When they were quizzing me about being a Christian imam, as they do, the first thing that they said to me was, You believe in three gods, sir. There is only one god. They certainly know their stuff from their own viewpoint. They're only little people. I answered these little men to the effect that there is only one god, yes, which took them back a little. But the Christians do not believe that there are three gods. Christians, I said, believe that there is only one god, but that that one god exists eternally in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But these three eternal persons, I said, are not three separate gods. They are all one and the same undivided God. That seemed to silence my inquirers, but there is always tomorrow. The other story is from a few months before. This time a secondary school girl approached me. She was year eight, one of my class about her Jehovah's Witnesses beliefs, and she bade me come to her meeting house for some kind of religious service to do with her family's faith at about Easter tide. So it was a few months ago. I said, as you do, what Jesus said, and I and I and my father are one, and that Jesus said, if you believe in God, believe in me also, thereby putting himself on the same level as equal with his father. Well, this did not go down too well with her parents, as they complained to the school that I had breached her human rights to freedom of belief in not respecting her religion. This did not get very far, however, as the parents had failed to mention that I was defending my freedom of religion in answering her questions. Teachers are supposed to answer questions, Mr. Gov. That is what they are paid for, and freedom of expression applies to everyone. That is one of the main ways in which we learn, uh, Mr. Gov. Some Jehovah's Witnesses <clears throat> who profess to follow the Holy Bible just do not seem to know how much of the Holy Bible supports the teaching of one Jehovah God in three eternal persons, the Blessed Trinity. Maybe it would be better to say the triunity, emphasising the unity in Trinity and the Trinity in unity of the one God, because that is really what all true Christians believe. True witnesses of Jehovah God believe in one God, but in three persons, and three persons in one God, neither confounding the persons, nor dividing the substance, as the Creed of Athanasius puts it, in the established Church's Book of Common Prayer of 1662. The doctrine of the Holy Trinity is so important that we should speak and teach a lot more upon it than we do. And so I propose this morning to give a few thoughts on the related doctrine of the Godhood of Christ, which forms part of the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, and which, as I have alluded to above, is often misunderstood by both Mohammedans, that is Muslims, and by other Unitarians who deny the Trinity, such as the self-styled Jehovah's Witnesses or Russellites, to whom I have also referred. I have already adverted to what Jesus said to his closest disciples as related by the Apostle John in his Gospel at chapter 14 and verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled, he said. 
Ye believe in God, believe also in me. And then he goes on to say, in my father's house are many mansions and so forth. God the Father is at the heart of the faith of the chosen nation Israel. God alone is to be the object of their trust. They are not to put faith in the arm of the flesh, Jeremiah 17 and verse 5, or any mere man. And yet Jesus is telling his nation and his closest disciples to put their faith in him on a par with their faith in the Father, whom he has just mentioned. The meaning is plain. Jesus and the Father are on one level as one God, meaning that Jesus is God, God the Son. There are clear indications of this in the Old Testament of the Jews and from what we know of the Jews at the time of Jesus, both from the New Testament and elsewhere in other Jewish sources. In The Jewish Gospels, the story of the Jewish Christ, a new book by Daniel Boyar, who is the professor of Talmud at the University of California at Berkeley. Professor Boyar informs us that the concept of a divine Messiah was not strange to the Jews at the time of Jesus. The basic underlying thoughts, he says, from which, quote, from which the Trinity and the Incarnation grew, are there in the very world into which Jesus was born, end of quotes. Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter 7 of the Old Testament, written in the mid-6th century BC, reflects earlier traditions within the Old Testament epoch of a dual father-son Godhead. Professor Boyer says that the New Testament is, quote, much more deeply embedded with Jewish life and thought than many have imagined, and even in the very moments that we take to be most characteristically Jewish as opposed to Christian, the notion of a dual Godhead with a father and a son, the notion of a Redeemer who will be both God and man, and the notion that this Redeemer would suffer and die as part of the salvational process is there. End of quote. I could have said as much simply from my own reading of the Old Testament, but I'm glad to have this scholar's corroboration, and as much is gotten from clear eavesdropping on Jesus' controversy with the Pharisees, as recorded in the New Testament, which we did in an earlier sermon on the Trinity, and so which I will not repeat here. Jesus was definitely claiming to be the second person of Jehovah. The Pharisees knew it, and that is why they sought to have the Romans crucify him in that he, being a man, made himself God. John chapter 10 and verse 33. Nonetheless, some folk have thought and sought to suggest that the dogma of the Holy Trinity was inspired by heathen Greek thought and from a kind of pagan metaphysical philosophy which they allege came into the church and triumphed in the church of the 4th century when indeed the doctrine of the Trinity was very clearly formulated using some Greek philosophical terms in the church creeds of Nicaea and Athanasius, the latter one of which I alluded to above. This is hardly surprising on a linguistic rather than a doctrinal level because the two creeds were, were written in Greek. So was the New Testament. So was Greek metaphysical thought. But this is to confuse somewhat Greek language, ecclesiastical and creedal formulations of the dogma, with the Jewish thought of the New Testament sources from which the dogma was itself drawn. And the substance of the doctrine of the Trinity is nowhere to be found in Greek philosophy or Greek mythology at all. It quite clearly therefore arises from and is taken from the first century written New Testament, itself rooted as that is, in millennia of Old Testament prophecy, allusion and teaching. The creedal trough, so to speak, from which we drink the truth of the Trinity may be second to fourth century and is certainly in Greek, but the well, the well from which the water of life is drawn, is Jewish in thought and is from both the first century New Testament and the centuries before that, going all the way back to Moses and to Genesis. The Trinity is everywhere in the Bible and nowhere in Greek heathen metaphysics. I also referred to another verse earlier, in which Jesus said to the Pharisees, I and my Father are one, John 10 and verse 30. They then took up stones to stone him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God, John 10 and verse 33. It could not really be any clearer, could it? 
At the beginning of John's Gospel, the writer, the Apostle John, starts with this very theme. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1 and verse 1. Verse 14 goes on to say, Of the Apostles, that we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. An earlier part of the same opening chapter says, verse 10, He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Verse 11, He came to his own, the Jews, and his own did not receive him. Verse 12, But as many as received him, Jew or Gentile, to them gave he the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. The Jews could not put their faith in anyone except Jehovah, that is, in God. Therefore, they could not put their faith in Jesus, as he bade them to do in John 14 and verse 1, You believe in God, believe also in me, unless they accepted him as one with the Father, which many of them could, could not do, and so, so they rejected him. That was what the whole controversy was and still is about with regard to the nation of Israel. That is why they were cast forth from the land to wander as strangers for many centuries. You see, my dear friends, the chosen nation is subject not only to the blessings of the covenant which God made with them, but also the curses of that covenant should they break it. Right from the very beginning God warned his chosen race that should they disobey him that he would cast them forth from their promised land, and that he would scatter them to the nations, and that among those nations that they would find no rest. Have a look at Deuteronomy 28, verses 64 to 68. You see, my dear friends, the Bible is an inspired book. It comes from heaven. It writes history before it happens. But from the first, to return to our theme, the New Testament church of Jew, and then of Jew and Gentile, always believed on him, that is, on Jesus as God. They could do nothing else, because they always accepted him as the second person of the Godhead as him being both with God and being himself God. John 1 and verse 1. No Jew could put his faith in anything other than God alone. It is true that the Russellites or Jehovah's Witnesses translate John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. They translated or rather mistranslated in a most peculiar way which does at least need some clearing up. In line with their false belief that Jesus was not claiming to be God, they translate this verse, or mistranslate this verse, at the end of John 1 and verse 1 in this way, and the word was with God, and the word was a God, rather than the word was God. Now this is a deliberate mistranslation, however, of what the original Greek says, and no other translation agrees with it. Moreover, it fails to match any of the scriptures which elsewhere talk of Christ's deity or godhood. And it, and it asserts, moreover, in the most direct terms, a belief which no Jew or Christian could accept, namely, that Jehovah has a little God beside him or before him. Now this is a clear breach of the first and most important of the Ten Commandments, which says in the King James Version, Exodus 20 and verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Jesus could not ask his disciples or his people to worship a God beside God. That would be polytheism. When we start to corrupt the Holy Bible, to contort it to our own heresies or prejudices, it is amazing what troubles we run into elsewhere in the Holy Bible, but that is the self-styled Jehovah's Witnesses for you. And by the way, I do respect their human rights. The Jehovah's Witnesses, however, are not the only cult which has difficulty with the Bible's teaching regarding the full deity or Godhead of our Lord. There are quite a few others hailing both from the 19th century and a lot earlier. I am currently having a go at Rowan Williams' magnum opus on Arius, who was the 4th century presbyter who denied the godhood of Christ and whose denial led to the Council of Nicaea. I will let you know how I get on. The cults that deny that Jesus is God, God the Son, all tend to have difficulty with the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. Ultimately, they say, on grounds of reason rather than on the grounds of what the Bible actually does say. As if a creature's reason can be more reliable than God's. They begin, however, taking advantage of our biblical illiteracy 
by trying to assert that the Bible does not teach the Godhead of our Lord. But once you get them to see that it quite clearly does, they then raise the whole issue of the Trinity, and then, once you get them to see that it does teach even that from the pages of the Bible, their last line of defence is that, well, the doctrine of three in one is just not to them rational or reasonable. I certainly cannot pretend that the doctrine of the Trinity is easy to explain or grasp any more than I can the doctrine of God becoming man and then dying for our sins. But the issue is surely not whether we can easily explain these facts and reconcile easily all aspects of these truths to one another, but rather whether these facts are set forth clearly as they are in Holy Writ. Of course, the cults do have their proof texts. Even in Bible sounder than the Jehovah's Witnesses' New World Translation, to try to show that Jesus never claimed to be God, and that the crucifixion of him at the behest of the Pharisees for making such claims that he was God was all really a great big misunderstanding. But on closer examination in their context and of what these scriptures do say, this is hardly borne out. And we will just go through a few of these verses, for to be forewarned is to be forearmed. And that really is the purpose of this morning's worship. One favourite verse to say that the Father and the Son are not equal comes from what Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 28. My Father is greater than I. Here we have the man, Christ Jesus, talking. The explanation of this verse is quite simple and is found in the creeds themselves. Christ is one person, but in two natures, human and divine. As to his divine nature as God, he is clearly equal to his Father, as he says elsewhere. But as to his becoming man, he must obviously be very much less than his Father. At times the one person of Christ affirms, as in John 14 and verse 28, my Father is greater than I, a truth which is befitting to one but not to the other nature. In affirming the equality of Christ with his Father, as to Christ's Godhead, we would not seek to deny either the incarnation of Christ, or his lowering or humiliation in being found in the form of a man. Seeing Philippian, see Philippians 2 and verses 5 to 9. In his nature as man, he is obviously less than the Father. And in his office of Redeemer, he is so too. The Creed of Athanasius fully acknowledges this when it says of Christ that he is equal to the Father as touching his Godhead and inferior to the Father as touching his manhood. But the cults affirm only the latter whilst denying the former. That is what makes them cults. Note also that the cults, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Christadelphians and so on, use verses which show Jesus luring to become a man, to show that he was never anything else. They use one truth of scripture, that he was or became a man, to try to show that he never was God. The truth, however, the true faith, however, is that though he were God the Son, with the Father from all eternity, Philippians 2.6, and that he lowered himself for our sakes and took, him, took upon himself our nature, Philippians 2, verses 7 to 8, that he might redeem us to God the Father by his own most painful death and most precious blood, from which damnation and death now God the Father has highly exalted him, to a name and to a position that he had not before. Look at Philippians 2 and verses 9 to 11. He is now, if I may put it like this, not just from eternity our great God and King, nor just become man 2,000 years ago, but he is also now our great and accomplished Redeemer. In him is not only the fullness of the Godhead bodily, he is God, Colossians 2 and verse 9, as well as being man. In him is not only the fullness of the Godhead bodily, which he had at the Incarnation, but the fullness of redemption, Colossians 1, verses 19 to 20, which he accomplished by his death, resurrection and ascension. We shall be worshipping him not only for him being the creator and maker of all things, but also for him being our redeemer. There has been a humiliation a lowering of the Saviour as God become man, and then hung upon the cross to bear our sins. There has been a humiliation and a lowering of him as the Redeemer, the messenger of the covenant, when he tasted the sting of death for every man, Hebrews 2 and verse 9. But he is no longer dead. He is risen and hath showed himself unto Peter, Luke 24 and verse 34. Do you remember Peter denied him? 
Moreover, he is ascended, and highly exalted as the messenger, the doer of the covenant, who has now fulfilled the covenant. The deed is done. The work is finished. He is now more than he was before, not just the one who would redeem, but the one who has redeemed. There is no other sacrifice for sin. Hebrews 10 verses 11 to 14. There has been a glorious exaltation of the Son of God. Outside of him there is only the wrath and the offended majesty of God and the terror of his broken law, ready at any moment to afflict us with everlasting pains and death. But within him, the Redeemer, by faith, there is fullness of redemption and salvation, and life forevermore. Another verse which the cults like to use to degrade our mighty, nay, our almighty Redeemer, is Colossians 1 and verse 15, in which it says he, quote, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Surely the word firstborn imports, they say, that he, Jesus, is made and not God. But that would gainsay the next verse, which says that, quote, for by him all things were created uh, that are made in heaven and that are on earth. Verse 16, all things were created through him and for him. End of quote. No, the word firstborn, which the cults rely on, does not mean that he is made, but that he is first, the preeminent one, over all the creation. Why? Well, because everything was made for him and through him. Verse 16, it tells us all of this in the immediate context. He is as the firstborn, not the first made, who takes or inherits all. His firstborn status his preeminence, in other words, is due not to the fact that he was made, but to the fact that all that was made was made for him and through him. The verse in its to context teaches the exact opposite of what the cults say that it teaches. A final verse which they often refer to is Revelation 3 and verse 14, quote, These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. End of quote. It is the risen, ascended and exalted Jesus who is talking. And he is described as the beginning of the creation of God. Surely that means that he is the first of God's creatures, the start of the creation, a creature and not the creator. And so part of the creation rather than the second person of the uncreated God. Not really. Rather the verse means that he is the source of the creation the beginning he is the source of the creation and so not part of it the creation is a consequence and the source or beginning of it is not the consequence but the cause it is rather like a spring or a fountain of water being the beginning or source of a stream but not being a part of the stream the stream is the product of the spring of water jesus is the beginning of the creation in that sense he is therefore its source and cause and not a part of it. Revelation 3 and verse 21 clarifies any abiding doubt by pointing out that Jesus has sat down on his Father's throne. A part of the creation, a creature, could certainly not sit down on God's throne. That would be the height of sin and folly. But the beginning or source of the creation of God, in the sense of being its cause, is no mere creature. The key is always to expound verses in their immediate and near context and to align their teaching with what is clearly said elsewhere. This is something the cult singularly fail to do for, it has to be said, ulterior reasons. It is something that the true church must always do, preach the truth. And when it is being true to its own calling, it does this adeptly and adroutly, readily. I began with a tale of how some of my Mohammedan and Jehovah Witnesses students or pupils at primary or secondary level quizzed me over the truth of the Holy Trinity, and I used that as a starting point for this very short and inadequate homily on the Godhood of Christ, both the Trinity and the Incarnation, 
<clears throat> of the second person of God to become man is peculiar to the genuine revelation of God to the Jews in the Old Testament period and to the church of Jew and then of Jew and Gentile in the time since the first century of our Lord. It is something which is vital to the true disciples of God and of Christ and which should and must be dear to the heart of any true believer. God has come down to man to redeem man to himself. That and that alone is our hope. The Unitarian dreams and delusions, whether based on the Book of Mormon or something like it, the Quran, or whether taken from a false view of what the Holy Bible does in fact teach, are all very false hopes. The Apostle John tells us, and let him have the last word on this subject, in his first epistle, that, quote, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 23. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you said to us that if we believed in God, we should believe in you also. O Lord, that we do. We acknowledge thee as the eternal Son of God, who was with the Father and is himself God. And in your blessed person and work we trust for our salvation. And grant to all people who doubt or deny these everlasting personal truths of thy gospel. Grant them the insight to see their truth and to possess that truth. And grant unto us all, O Lord, that that truth shall possess us. And now may the blessing of one undivided God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, abide with us and remain with us always, for evermore. Amen.